This is joint work with uh, Daniel Genkin and with Nadia Henninger. I think that both are here in the crowd. Uh, in, when we do attacks, there is a life cycle that we always follow. We start by uh, finding a vulnerability and we tell that uh, something may be vulnerable. And then there is denial. Um, you can't do that, we don't need to fix that, no problem. So someone comes and issue a warning, you need to really fix that. And then someone dis uh, describes an, an exploit. And when the exploit comes, the vendor fix the uh, problem and later someone will publish the paper, probably those who found the exploit. And in the exploit, in that paper, there will be the future work section that discloses another vulnerability. <laughs> so let's follow this cycle. Round one. 2002, Tsunu and others uh, publish a cache attack on Misty. So uh, no one really took notice of that because it was Misty and it was theoretical and it didn't really work. And so no one changed anything. No one uh, issued any warnings. But in 2005, Percival published a real attack working against OpenSSL RSA. So the attack that he did uh, works on the cache. And we now go, we'll now describe how the attack works. Basically, the cache is a short, is a small memory that sits between the um, main memory and the uh, CPU. And the purpose of the cache is to uh, bridge the uh, speed gap between the uh, slow memory and the fast CPU. And the cache consists of, S, uh, consists of sets. It's organized as sets to which uh, locations in memory map. And the few ways, which is the number of uh, memory locations that can be stored in each set. And the mapping is very simple. We take the memory and some addresses in memory uh, map to a single set. For each address, there is the set that it maps and it will always be stored in this set. Uh, but it can be stored in any of the ways of the set and if the cache has four ways in the set, we call that the four-way associative set, make a cache. So, the attack, Sorry. Um, so the attack that uh, Percival published in the same year, uh, Oswick, Shomir, and Tromer published the same attack, is very simple. The attacker picks a, a cache size buffer in memory, accesses this cache, uh, this buffer, so the buffer will be cached, and the attacker fills the cache with the contents of this buffer, and then we'll let, it will let the victim execute a bit. And whenever the victim access a line in memory, <coughs> this line will be brought into the cache. And when it, it is brought into the cache, that evicts one of the attacker's lines from the cache. So what the attacker does now is read back the cache and find where read, in which cache sets the reads are a bit slower. And they will be slower in the places that the victim has accessed and replaced some of the attacker's memory. So the attacker can find out which cache sets the victim has accessed. What can we do with that? To understand what we can do, we first need to see the uh, attacked algorithm. And the algorithm that we show you here is uh, what's called fixed window exponentiation. It's a way to do modular exponentiation. The algorithm is very simple. We first pre-compute two to the W values that are basically the base uh, the base is A to the power of, of I. So calculate A to zero, which is easy, that's one, and A to one, which is easy, we have A, and A to two, and so forth, until A to two to the W minus one. Then we do the exponentiation itself. We scan our exponent as a group of bits size of size W. There are two to the W minus one possible values. We do W squares, and then we multiply by the value of the ith digit or the ith group of the, uh, exp the uh, ex bits of the exponent. Now, an adversary that can find what we've uh, we multiplied here can recover the exponent. 
In the case of RSA uh, decryption or in uh, RSA signature, I mean, that would be a, a value that better kept secret. So what uh, Percival did is run the attack that I described earlier on a very similar algorithm, and this is what he got. This is um, a heat map of the axis to the cache where we have the cache, line, the cache sets in the horizontal axis and time in the vertical axis. And the, the, uh, the color or the, um, the shade uh, indicates how long it took to access that cache set. And we look at that over time and we see these blocks here. And if we compare it against the ground truth, we can, understand, we can find that these are the square operations. And when we don't have the blocks, we have a small line in, some, in one of the cache sets. And the location of this line will depend on which value we multiplied by. So this breaks the system. So Percival published the attack. Intel rushed to help and published a fix using a technique called scattergather. So what does scattergather do? If we look at memory allocation, we allocate the uh, data that we the multipliers that we pre-computed, standard allocation will allocate every byte of these multipliers in consecutive locations in memory. So we'll have the first multiplier in memory byte zero, and then in byte one, and then byte two, and so forth. And if we map the two cache lines, we'll have the first multiplier, say, in the first three, ca in three cache lines, and the second multiplier will appear in three cache lines later, and so forth until we cover the whole multipliers. The whole, all of the multipliers. So basically the attack identifies by finding, that's ex exactly what creates the pattern that we see, the, we see in the attack. Scatter gather changes the order that the bytes are stored in memory. In each cache line, it stores one or a few bytes of each multiplier. So now, that's the, in the preparation stage, we scatter the uh, multipliers over the cache. And when we need to use them, the uh, software accesses each of these bytes, collects the data, and creates the, recovers the multiplier and multiplies by it, but from a fixed location. So we have accessed all of the cache lines, and we don't see the pattern anymore on the cache. Uh, OpenSSL has gone through several uh, stages of modifications to improve performance. And the current implementation, or the one before current implementation, um, used a slightly modified uh, approach. The way they organized the memory is that every group of four cache lines, cache lines had, uh, in, contains eight bytes of each multiplier. So if we have multiplier zero, the first eight bytes will be in what we, we now call bin zero. That's byte zero to seven of the first cache line of the first group. And then we'll have bytes 8 to 15 will be in the first cache line of the second group, and so forth. And each, other, each of the multipliers will have a different location in the cache. Now, if they only collect the locations that the multiplier is in, that would leak information, because we'll see for multipliers that are in the first cache line, we'll see activity on lines with, that are a, in number a 0 modulo 4, and if we access um, locations in the second cache line, we'll see that in lines that are one module four. So we'll see the difference. To overcome that, what OpenSSL does is access each of these and then use some bit tricks to select the one that they want. So in each access, for example, to, mul uh, to multiplier zero, they access all of the locations in uh, bin zero and they, and, and they just use the ones that they need. So this mitigates the attack. So that's good. We have the mitigation. 2005, 2006, Bernstein and Oswick Shamir Tromer said, this is not enough. This is not enough because there is something called cash banks. So we will now look at what cash banks are. When processor started to become faster and do multi-scalar operations, they start doing multiple accesses to a memory in parallel. And the, um, 
tendency of computers doing things in parallel keep increasing, and the cache became a bottleneck. So instead of having a single cache that, have a single, that has a single entry, Intel divides the cache into currently 15 banks. And if we have two accesses to, to the cache that try to get or change data in different banks, they proceed in parallel. If we have multiple accesses to the same cache bank, then one of them will be served immediately, and the other will wait a cycle. And this creates timing variation based on which cache bank we access. And the cache banks are within the cache, so uh, there is a risk there. So that's the beginning of the second cycle. We have this paper telling us that there is a problem, and in 2011, where do we have that? Uh, Ernie Brickell gave the uh, ramp session in chess, saying that OpenSSL mitigates the uh, side channels because it accesses every cache bank, every cache line in memory. So we don't have a, a secret dependent access at the resolution uh, lower than cache uh, line. In 2013, uh, Bernstein and uh, Schwabe stood, I think it was here, was it? Yeah, I don't. And said that there is, a, and demonstrated that there is, that there are timing variation. In 2015, Peter Schwabe asked the world to provide a real attack, and if Peter Schwabe asks, we do. So, <laughs> this is, this is our work. Um, what we did is basically an attack that we call cache bleed, uh, thanks to Dan for the same, Dan Bernstein. We have the code for the attack. We first take the time, put it in store, sorry, in location, and then we just go and access memory locations that are spaced by 40 hexabytes, that's 64, that's exactly cache, a uh, size of a cache line. And we add them to various registers, and we, we just want to do as many cache accesses in that as we can, and register R9, the offset there, will tell us which cache bank we access. And, we time, and at the end of these 256 accesses, we take the timer again, subtract from the previous timer, and we got how long this operation took. And now we start drawing graphs of what we get. So if we have uh, our cache bleed running with no, nothing else happening in the other hyperthread, we get the count at below 250 that show us that the processor is really doing more than one operation per cycle because we had at least 256 additions there, and all of them managed manage to get in less than 256 cycles. Once we add another, uh, hyper, uh, another uh, program running in the other hyperthread, a program that just does compute nothing in memory, we already see some change in the timing. Uh, the reason is that the, the uh, core shares multi uh, multiple resources between the two hyperthreads, and the other hyperthread uh, uses something else. If the, uh, the other uh, hyperthread, if the other hyperthread run, runs a program that always accesses the same cache bank that we are trying to access, we see that we su suddenly we see the effect of these. Uh, uh, cash bank collisions. But this is not a real scenario, I and mean, our, our uh, victim will never access just one cash bank. So we tried looking at a mixed load. In this case, it was three computing uh, instructions and one access to memory, uh, where the access to memory can be, in one scenario, access to the same cash bank that we are monitoring, and in another, access to a different cash bank. And we see that we get two diff clearly distinct distributions, but there is some overlap, so we cannot by use a single sample to uh, and decide whether there was an access to the cache bank or not. In real life, this, these distributions are even much more closer together because the accesses are much more sparse than one in every three, and they are not always going to the same cache bank. So. We tried this thing on OpenSSL. What we did is we captured a thousand, uh, the, captured the trace of 
a running cache bleed, a thousand, time, a thousand traces of cache bleed running in parallel with OpenSSL decryption. And this is what we get if we monitor bin zero or any of the even bins. We get the, uh, the line that looks like the top. If we get monitor cache uh, bin one or any of the odd bins, we get the bit lower. And we can clearly see that OpenSSL is doing something, then drops, and then do something, uh, repeat doing something, and drops again. And this is uh, something that we would expect. The, this uh, OpenSSL uses the Chinese remainder theorem uh, RSA, so it does two exponentiation. And the difference between the lines, we later found out that the reason that dif there is difference between the line is the algorithm that they use for uh, doing the modular reduction. It uses 128-bit um, uh, numbers, so it has different access patterns to odd and to even bins. Anyway, if we zoom in a bit, we see a pattern like that. We see a group of nine uh, peaks followed by something a bit wider. And this is something that we would expect because we have uh, W being five, so we'll have five squares followed by multiplication, and we'll have modular reductions in between them, so that gives us 10 and uh, our, and our uh, multiplication. Sorry, we have four, um, four squares and, and the, uh, the w four, uh, window four. Four squares and multiplication and the uh, modular reductions in between. That total of 10. The more important thing is that in some of the multiplication, we see that one of the lines for the bins is a bit higher than the others. And when we look at our, uh, at our run truth, we can find out that the bin, the number of the bin corresponds to the three least significant digits, or it's three least significant bits in the window. Okay? So we have the data uh, from that. I do not show the uh, even bins here because they appear over here and the clash and the graph doesn't look really nice. So that's beautiful, problem almost solved. However, here we are at somewhere at the beginning of the uh, exponent. When we go to the end of the exponent, we have a bit of a problem. The, uh, while OpenSSL does exponentiation, the operating system runs and timing starts to skew and we try to average 1,000 skew timers and we get what looks like noise. So we pass that noise through a low pass filter. And again, we start seeing some nice waves and some of them are higher than others. And if we collect all the waves, we can just read the bits. So here is bin seven, a bit higher than everyone else, and bit seven again, and bin seven again, and bin four, and so forth. So we just got all the, uh, the three least significant bits of each of the windows. So that's good, but that's only 60% of the bits of the, uh, secret, uh, of the exponent. And for, this is for 2048 bits RSA, that leaves um, about 400 bits to guess. So to guess the, so instead of guessing these, we used um, the henninger shacham te technique that uh, basically span, uh, spans tree and col uh, collect information from both sides of the, uh, uh, of the, of the information we know on both uh, exponents. And within two hours, two CPU hours, which takes about three minutes on Nadia's uh, machine, uh, we got the exponent. So we're back at the uh, circle. We told OpenSSL. OpenSSL issued a fix for that. And we got our paper. What OpenSSL did is two things. The first is they use 128-bit threads instead of 64 bits. And they used the original masking that they needed. So even if they leak, they would leak only two bits per per exponent. That's below the threshold that we need to do uh, if we wanted. 
The other problem is that instead of reading the same cache, the same cache bank, or the same bin at each read, they read diagonally in each line. So each four accesses cover the whole cache. The order that they will access these four, make these four accesses depends on the secret exponent. Uh, but th we don't know yet how to uh, extract that number or how to find this order. It's, the effect is probably too small for us to detect it with the technology we have today. So that's bring us, we notified OpenSSL about that. The, the response was, um, you can't do that and you like challenges, so here's a challenge for you. So we are at the beginning of the third round and now with that, um, we'll have to leave until someone come as, comes up with a fix. So th thank you everyone for listening and uh, that's what I have to say. Thank you.